thank you uh, for staying put. Uh, we've saved the best for last. I, I uh, talked about Greg Dalton this morning, and so we're sort of bringing it back to the, the big picture that we discussed this morning regarding climate change and the fact that uh, there's a lot of apathy in this country about climate change. Uh, less than one-third of Americans think that it's even a, a priority for policy. Greg Dalton, who founded uh, Climate One at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, has a very high-quality program there that I've, I mentioned this morning, uh, and he has a lot of very good material on his website. Uh, and I've invited Greg here uh, this afternoon to address this very issue. Thanks, Colin. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm really uh, excited to be here. And it, this is, a, I feel like a fish out of water here. I'm usually in the interviewer's chair asking questions of, of people and uh, not sharing my own ideas, et cetera. But uh, actually going through this helped me organize some thoughts to share with you here at the end. Uh, so I've run this radio show and program a TV show called Climate One in San Francisco. And since I went to the Arctic in 2007, I've interviewed a couple hundred people working on this from lots of different perspectives. People working at the international perspective with the UN uh, FCCC, the IPCC, uh, political leaders, uh, business people, sat down with uh, Governor Schwarzenegger five times when he was in office, uh, members of the president's cabinet, the governor's cabinet, et cetera, and each looking at a different perspective on water, food, climate. So I'm going to share some ideas and thoughts about public apathy and what's uh, different systems and what uh, and apply that to food and water. Uh, so I've been looking at this through the, the climatic system, uh, the political system, the economic system, the food system, the water systems, all these systems levels kinds of thing. And ultimately where I've been lately is thinking about one of our biggest cha challenges is in our cognitive system. You know, the challenges, there's lots of systemic challenges and some of the biggest ones are, are right in here, inside our heads. And I know, uh, so that's something I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so Climate One connects people, connects ideas. Uh, carbon is connected to everything. Once you start thinking about carbon, it's in everything we do, everything we eat. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so one day a few uh, years ago, I was conducting a Climate One conversation at the Commonwealth Club, and someone stood up in the audience. We have live audience questions. And he said, you all are operating by the information deficit delusion. You think that dispersing more facts will solve the problem and will change people's not minds. And it really got, it's got me to stop for a minute. I've been a journalist for a long time. I think how many people in academia, the news, uh, people think, you know, think tanks putting out papers think that, ah, oh, if people just read this, if people just have the same information, it'll change their minds, it'll change policy, et cetera. There's the premise that more information leads to more action. So, uh, in fact, one time I was interviewing Bill McKibben, and he said, well, my theory of change used to be pretty simple. I would write books, people would read my books, and the world would change. And he figured out, he informed a lot of people, and, but he figured out, he, that's why he went to becoming an advocate, is that writing books, providing them for more information, inform some people, didn't realize the change uh, that he was hoping for. So I uh, booked a guy named Jonah Sachs, who runs an advertising firm, uh, and he wrote a, a book called Story Wars. And he talks about how uh, the importance of stories and narrative and the power of narrative and how that really uh, is what changes people's minds. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen the story of stuff or the story of change, the story of solutions, uh, Annie Leonard is an internet rock star that does those. And those have gone viral on the web. And it's, you know, it's simple storytelling in a way that people, people remember. Well, Jim Hansen, he went before Congress and testified in 1988, first congressional testimony about climate change. He laid out some facts. He told the adults what was happening. He thought his job was done. And he went back to his lab and thought, okay, I, I, I informed people this is happening, this is the evidence we have. And he realized uh, it didn't work. You know, dispersing more, presenting facts, didn't change policy, et cetera. You know, he's trained, like a lot of us, to believe that, that facts would... Um, Facts would change things. I interviewed Paul Hawken recently, the environmentalist and author, and he said that actual factual onslaughts can actually cause people to dig into their own point of view. Facts can be debated. 
You can, you can uh, debate facts uh, and it can harden people's points of view and people often seek facts that fit their worldview. Um, you know, climate deniers are, are, are highly intelligent. Try to debate, you, you, maybe you've met some people, you try to say, you know, the icebergs are melting and they'll point to the one place in Antarctica where the ice is actually expanding, right? So it's really tough uh, to, to debate on the factual level with some people, particularly where they're informed and intelligent. Um, so I talked with, with Jonah about the importance of stories and then we got into villains and heroes, some, some classic uh, ingredients in, in stories over time. Uh, and and in, the, in the climate story, a lot of it is our individual action. We're the villains. That's what's really scary about this. We're part of the problem. It's not like a lot of other things where there's an enemy over there. It's the Germany or Al Qaeda, et cetera. We're part of the problem. That's really hard for us. And so actually Jonah and some others have tried to turn it around. That's, you know, when you think you're part of the problem, it can be really, we don't know what to do with that information. It, it really can be challenging for us. So Jim Hansen, thinks that uh, he's had some really strong language that oil companies are guilty of crimes against humanity. Pretty strong stuff. Uh, Bill McKibben wants to bankrupt morally the oil companies and say that they are evil, they, they are the villains in this. Um, in your world, there's you certainly no farmers are the problem or, or the cities or the Met or whatever it is or the, the enviros, right? To, to villainize something and that's very natural and I think it's been pretty pretty counter, uh, counterproductive. Um, heroes, we all think about heroes, the hero's journey, someone who's reluctantly called to service to go out, slay the dragon, kill the Death Star, come back, save the kingdom, right? Where are the heroes in this? Um, we think about, agri you know, perhaps in food, whether it's Cesar Chavez, Alice Waters, perhaps it's Norman Borlaug, father of the Green Revolution. Who are the heroes in, in food and agriculture? Um, certainly in, in climate science, I think of the scientists. They, if you went into climate science uh, in the 70s, 80s, even, even in the 90s, didn't expect to be pulled into the political realm the way climate scientists have been recently. Uh, they didn't sign up for what they got involved in. I think if you go into climate science now, you know you're entering a contact sport and it's a pretty rough thing. Um, scientists have Ben Santer, others, uh, harassed with Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, death threats, you open up your email, I've talked to scientists who open up their email and they get a death threat and their young child is looking over their shoulder. Pretty rough stuff. Uh, and those are some of the heroes, I think. Uh, and some of them, uh, Steve Schneider and Lee Shipper in particular, li literally gave their lives to the cause. Um, but I would caution against thinking about that there's going to be some hero that's going to come deliver us or save us. Who's the Martin Luther King of the climate movement? Or who's, you know, who's Barack Obama? Whoever it is, is pretty much disappointing. And Jonah and I talked a little bit about the hero journey stories, about metaphors, about how we become heroes in our own small way. And that's a lot of what I'm going to mention today is individual action, the importance of individuals. Uh, yes, we need policy. Yes, we need a price on carbon, all these sorts of things. But individual action can really matter. And uh, he cited Joseph, Hamble, Joseph Campbell saying, you know, hero is someone who sacrifices in, in their own position some comfort for the, for the greater good. Villains and heroes uh, in, this, in this climate story. One time I interviewed a sixth grader uh, in Marin who participated in a, in a school play. It was about climate change, you know, trying to convey to kids, right? And so there was uh, Mr. Carbon was the bad guy and he was, <laughs> he was hurting the polar bear. And, and then the, the hero comes along and chases away Mr. Gar Mr. Carbon and you know, saves the day. Um, and so uh, Paul Hawken again said that I think the age of heroes is over, the charismatic male vertebrate coming to save us. I think we're looking for love in all the wrong places. Um, he talked about a, a climate ride and here is something that's really challenging that I've been wrestling with myself I'd like to share with you. Uh, climate ride is kind of like the AIDS ride. You know, it's a charity ride, raise money, raise awareness. So he participated in the climate ride and people on the climate ride uh, were chanting, we are carbon free. Well, Paul noted, they are eating bagels, carbohydrates, uh, roasted coffee, and they're riding carbon frame bicycles. Um, so he said, I hope you're not carbon free. Uh, that's a distortion <laughs> of life. Uh, you know, he's trying to turn carbon from an enemy into something very different. And this is Paul Hawkins saying that carbon is the element that holds hands and collaborates in nature. And we're going to have to be like carbon and hold hands and collaborate. And to do that, we have to change how we talk to each other and how we listen. 
one of the reasons that you know Climate One does these conversational kinds of things, like like Colin has done here today. Climate change is happening to us, is the prevailing view. It's a bad thing happening to us. We're victims, and when that happens, you look for villain, villains and demons, and you try to, to separate. He says, and I try to go here, I'm not sure I can get this optimistic, climate change is happening for us. It's a huge opportunity that open up, opens up extraordinary possibility. Now try to get your head around that. Climate change is a good thing. You know, we heard Karen Ross talk earlier today about there's opportunity in every, every challenge. But there is a lot of doom and gloom in the climate. It can be really depressing. A lot of the climate community is really depressed. To think about all this stuff all the time can be very depressing. Um, which is why we need people like Stephen Colbert. When, when uh, the National Climate Assessment came out, he said it was so scary he had carbon footprints in his pants. You know, <laughs> like you need those kinds of light moments to, uh, you know, no one says it better than him, you know, which gets to the hope and the fear. We've had that here in the room today. There's been hope and fear. These people said, I hope, and there's fear. Um, I think we need some fear because without fear, we don't have the urgency. Uh, we need a little bit of fear. Uh, because without fear, companies wouldn't go fast enough, faster. Uh, without fear, um, it's just not, it's a, not a, a good place to live and, and stay, um, the fear, because it can be really, really debilitating. I interviewed Andy Revkin, who writes the Dot Earth blog one time for the New York Times, and he said, you know, of the many systems, again, I'm kind of borrowing from him, this cognitive system is the one that's, that's really in interesting. Um, you know, to think about denial, it's, it's illogical. How can people be climate deniers with so much information out there? Uh, there's a book, well, there's a book called The Merchants of Doubt, and there's, uh, uh, it's going to be turned into a film by Jeff Skoll uh, that Naomi Oreski is now at Harvard wrote. And there's definitely the manufacture of doubt out there just that's deliberately trying to confuse people. But there's other reasons why denial and skepticism uh, is, is valid and, and held by people. And it, part of it is the cognitive system. You know, our brains are wired for the tiger in the bushes. It's a clear and present and visible threat. Uh, we're not wired for something that we can't see, touch, taste, or smell. How is that a threat? How is carbon a threat? Particularly if you think carbon is part of us and carbon is, is, is part of uh, life. If you're a religious person, I've interviewed religious leaders, uh, you know, a rabbi from Israel and, and the head of the national uh, um, um, uh, religious or organizations, the BAP National Baptist Conference, and to think that humans can change the climate is blasphemous in some religious communities. That's God's job. It's, it's arrogant to think that humans can change the atmosphere. Only God can do that. And that really comes up against their, their value system and, and bounces off. Um, you know, a lot of the climate communication is, is negative, and I think it's, we're finding out it's been ineffective. You read, it's like it's always doom and gloom. And I'm a former journalist. Journalists write about the planes that crash. A plane crashing safely, so a plane landing safely, a plane landing safely is not news. A plane crashing is headline news everywhere, right? So we're, there's some real structural reasons why people focus on the negative, and particularly the climate stuff gets really dark. Recently, I interviewed uh, Josh Friedman, who's an author, and Dan Goldman. How many people, have people read Emotional Intelligence? A lot of people have read that in the business world. He also wrote a book called Ecological Intelligence. And we talked about kind of this human and emotional aspects with uh, George Lakoff, who's a, a linguist at Cal. Um, and Josh Friedman said that drawing lines, identifying white hats and black hats, uh, is really counterproductive. It pushes people away from dialogue into strife. Again, thinking about the water wars in California, good, bad, I'm on this side, you're on that side. And there's actually brain level research into this. Our brains, when that happens, it narrows our attention. We focus on short-term survival, narrowing on self-interest. We don't actually move into, into change. Our brain has positive circuits and negative circuits. And people who research this stuff will say, Climate communication needs to focus a lot more on the opportunity, the upside, rather than all the bad stuff that's going to happen to us, because that's debilitating and depressing, and it actually, at the brain level, environmental groups uh, fall into this. If I get another, you know, every time I get a piece of direct mail with a polar bear on it, I throw it away and say, ah, oh, another one, right? It works in the short term to say, write a check or else this polar bear will die. It, it works for the, the business model of some environmental groups. It works in political campaigns. You know, this, you know, Colin's a bad guy, don't vote for him, vote for me. It works. Uh, but it doesn't work 
in, in the long run. Um, some of the talk with Brian, uh, we did with Dan Goldman and George Lakoff was about tribes. We heard a reference here shortly ago, the ags, the enviros, the urbans, right? Into these groups, there's a lot of, there's a tribal level to this. Um, I was reading uh, E.O. Wilson's Social Conquest of Earth recently, and he writes about people have to have a tribe. It gives them a name in addition to their own and social meaning in a chaotic world. And the cost of be going against your cry tribe in the old days could be expulsion, death, going against your tribe. Think about this. Um, you think about the conservative denial of climate. It's an article of faith that climate change is not happening. If it is happening, humans are not causing it. If we are causing it, we can't do anything about it. And anyone, it's, it's a tribal, it's, it's accepted as a matter of faith. People like Bob Inglis, who challenged that, former Republican member of uh, Congress in South Carolina, is, is basically kicked out of the tribe uh, at a very painful cost. And, and uh, I would say the same thing happens on, on the left. Most people on the left start from nuclear power is bad, because that's what they're, and how many of them actually look at the science and you know, think, well, really, is there radioactive uh, a material in my fish from Fukushima? Oh, they probably think automatically, yes. Well, if you look at the science, I'm not convinced. On GMOs, if you're on the left, you probably think GMOs are bad. How many people on the left really understand GMOs or have looked at the science? Um, it's an article of faith there. It, you know, this sort of, it's part of our tribes and it's part of the emotions uh, that, that drive us. We're not governed by reason detached from emotion. You know, this idea of sort of 17th century enlightenment that more information, reason will prevail. Sometimes people still hold on to that and think that the, you know, good ideas and truth will win the day. You know, George Lakoff said the problem with, with uh, Democrats is they went to college. Um, pretty interesting coming from a Cal professor, uh, but there's thought, still thought that more information and reason uh, will win the day. And what we talked about a lot was uh, sort of empathy and the need to, to empathize with people who are on the other side. It's something we try to do at Climate One, get people together to have a little more common understanding. Uh, oil companies and enviros. Um, one time we got together Tim Koopman, who's the president of the California Cattlemen's Association, uh, with a vegan author who thinks that the industrial uh, animal protein you know, machine is, is pretty bad news. And it was uncomfortable for both of them, but they actually personally hit it off and established a rapport. And they both talked about, well, you're not a factory farm guy, so you're okay. You're a small time guy. So, uh, but they, you know, I'd like to think that they humanized it and they at least had a little bit of human respect uh, and walked away from that with a little bit of understanding for like, okay, this cattleman, you know, and that's the way so those things can, uh, can start, a little bit of understanding. I want to end by talking about, you know, a little bit about the importance of individual action. Um, I think we all get hung up a lot. You heard earlier today, Max said, well, if California did, went to zero, it's 1%, you know, it wouldn't change things. So I think, well, if California, we just had the governor here. If he can't get, you know, the whole state, then what do I matter? It doesn't really matter what I do. Well, I think you do matter, and I do matter. And individual action does matter in ways that uh, goes beyond sort of the this, this simple carbon of it. Um, quoting Paul Hawken here a lot, but he says, uh, there is only consequential action. There is no inconsequential ac action. Um, you know, incrementalism, there's a paradox. Incrementalism is not enough, but incrementalism is really all we have. Uh, so I think that, you know, the, the conclusion that individual action doesn't matter um, go, takes us to a place where we don't matter. If we don't matter, then it's, it's just a very dark place. Um, I bought an electric car in, in 2011, and you can read a lot about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. If you consider the, the, the battery, what went into manufacturing the battery, uh, the fuel, et cetera, it's powered by solar on the roof. And you, you can do the whole, that carbon uh, assessment, but I think there's some things that economists and others don't me measure, which are the social impact. When my wife was driving around, and that EV for the first couple of months, like people were coming up into her, like, wow, this is so cool. Where's the tailpipe? No tailpipe. Where do you put the gas? No gas. Uh, and there was a sort of a social demonstration effect uh, that, that can be really powerful. Um, the Nissan Leaf, that, not ours, but the new ones, are made in Tennessee. They're made in a red state. So there are people who have jobs, green jobs, in a red state that you're supporting if you buy an electric car. Um, you're not giving money to oil companies. You're not giving money to 
to uh, foreign petro states. There's lots of good things to justify that, that electric car. What I won't say you know, is that that's the place to stop. It's a, as Annie Leonard says, that's a good place to start. You don't stop there and say, OK, I bought a Prius. I'm good. I could talk at cocktail parties and say, yeah, I got my Prius. Um, I'm good. I got that halo, right? Uh, that's, that's doesn't, it's not enough. Uh, you got That's a starting place, not a stopping place. Um, I interviewed Dan Nocera, who's a, a, a energy innovation professor at Harvard, and, and we were at the California Academy of Sciences, where there are lots of Tesla owners. And he it took great relish in telling those people, "Don't think that your Tesla is you know, solving the problem. Uh, it's not. It, but it's doing some pretty cool things. It, it's certainly a, a big, important place um, to start." Um, so, we're, you know, I think what's to really get at this, we need to think about the combination of the natural sciences and the social sciences uh, to get the, the, the human side, different parts of our brain, different institutions thinking differently, um, and uh, to really get at these some of the things. We need policy, we need action, we need a price on carbon, all those things. And I think everyone in this room also needs to do more um, every day. One thing, I've done a lot of interviews the last few years where it was policy, policy, policy. And in some places, California, we have strong policies. They need to be implemented. We're not going to get real meaningful national policy. Uh, and I've started recently to hear uh, people in um, you know, Tom Steyer's camp and others talk about culture, bike, share, you know, bike riding. You know, bike riding is not something that could have a real big cultural impact. It's starting to reshape uh, San Francisco and other places, bike sharing. Uh, getting people out of their cars uh, can be really significant. Their car ownership, you know, the number of 18-year-olds that have their driver license is down. Pe peak car, you start to hear about this term, peak car, I was reading about in The Economist. You know, people thinking about, right, uh, this, unlike peak oil, this one might be real. Um, so the idea of culture supporting that policy, if we get the culture in place, we change the way we think and the way we live, then perhaps the policy will, will happen there. But don't think that the politi politicians are going to come save us and, and, uh, and deliver us. You know, so positive stories, the need for, for positive food is a great positive story. It really is. It's a way to connect with people's stomachs. People relate to it. Food cuts across political boundaries. I was at had lunch in Little Rock, Arkansas, in a factory on Friday, and there was quinoa and kale. I was like, well, really? Uh, I was, um, you know, f five years ago, that would never happen to have that kind of plant, superfood, plant-based protein at a, f at a factory in Little Rock. Um, food is a tremendously powerful story. As, as Michael Pollan says, you vote with your fork. We get to do it every day. Farmers markets, how powerful that's been. It cuts, cuts against the centralized, industrialized models that are based on, on cheap food. Uh, fossil fuels. One of the things I think was implicit in a lot, some of the export talk today in California, you know, a lot of the export markets are driven by cheap fossil fuels. With price on carbon, some of those markets will be different. Um, organics is a very positive story. Um, good for the planet, good for us. I asked Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, a few months ago if organics were productive. And he said organics constitute 1% of farmland and four to five percent of sales. That's good value added. That's just good economics. Uh, they use less energy. Um, and as Jeannie Merrill, who I think was here earlier, pointed out to me one time, organic sales continued to grow through the Great Recession. So it's a great, great food. Um, organics are great positive stories. Uh, I mentioned GMOs. I'll just mention that in the um, interest of trying to get people together and see some uh, uh, find some common ground. Uh, on June 11th, uh, the CTO of Monsanto will come to Climate One and uh, have a conversation with Andrew Kimbrell, who's Center for Food Safety, one of the biggest opponents of GMOs. Um, if you're welcome to come to that or listen to the podcast, uh, but we can get uh, people together in a room and try to have a civil conversation. Um, it's just what I'm trying to do to try to, uh, try to get people together to um, depolarize things. So I'll just close by mentioning um, another time where someone stood up recently at a Climate One event and said, look, this is all very depressing. It were, it was, this was the emotional intelligence event. And it's like, this climate is very depressing. People care about three things, food, fun, and sex. Okay? You need to get food, fun, and sex into the climate conversation. And that's the way that you'll get people's attention. I would note that all of those can be enhanced, all of those pleasures can be enhanced with water. So um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, 
go with that where you want. So, um, so just all the more reason to use it wisely uh, here in California. But I was thinking about that. Okay, food, fun, and sex. I, I thought about a climate one calendar. Okay, with, you know, like the fireman sort of thing. Think about Colin in a cornfield somewhere. And his overalls, maybe one of them's a little bit undone, right? <laughs> Jim Boyd in a Speedo swimming in Lake Tahoe. I don't know, right? We could have all the climate leaders, Ben Sancher, you know, in his lab with his shirt off. I don't know. Um, try to have a little bit of foot, because we need it. You know, we need, we need Stephen Colbert and, and others to, to lighten us. So some of the themes, I think, that are coming out of these interviews are the, the need for empathy, the need for positive facts matter, but they don't really change people's minds. Um, tell stories and... Um, food, fun, and sex. Uh, and for us to do more, I think we have a video I wanted to share with you, just some other people um, sharing what they do. This is like a one-minute video sort of on individual action, what they can do and what you can do to, to do more. What can an average person do to combat climate change? It seems so big that many people wonder, what can I do that has an impact? I did a lot of low-hanging fruit, a lot of the energy efficiency, um, making sure that, that the windows had the fittings and that all of our light bulbs were efficient. Most recently, uh, we're going to get rid of the nine-person jacuzzi in the backyard of the house in Oakland we just bought uh, and replace it with a uh, treehouse so we don't have to heat 500 gallons of water. <laughs> uh, so that's probably the best thing anybody can do is understand their water use. We started out in uh, 2001 with a uh, total water use of 300,000 gallons. And last year it was 100,000 gallons. On the outdoors, is paying attention to how your how your outdoor is landscape. I'm also very aware of, of how we uh, grow things in our backyards and, and what type of systems we use. They say 15 to 20 percent of the first uh, steps in conserving energy is very easy to do. You walk to the store instead of drive. It's the next 20 percent that is very very difficult. Well, I have not owned a car since 2004. <laughs> Using more public transportation and teaching my kids about public transportation also. I walk and I ride my bike. <laughs> travel, um, reduce travel significantly. Probably the biggest personal thing is I'm a vegetarian. I buy clothes, you use clothing. I look like it too, <laughs> The big ticket is that, that we've, we've got to have a political system where our representatives uh, recognize that, uh, that this is something that needs to be acted on. Help school kids understand what's happening. There will come a time when we must all decide between what is easy and what is right. I, I've become a, a firm supporter and believer that, that, that if all of us did what we could, it, it would begin to add up and make a difference. <laughs> So I'd be happy to talk about any questions you have in the time we have left. I know it's been a long day. I want to get you in on this. So it's just, um, we didn't put that together for this particular program. We put that together for, uh, for audiences at Climate One just to try to get people to think about what they can do more. So I'm wondering about the contradictions that I, that I see. They're asking us in the state as citizens that we, you know, uh, conserve by using two minutes showers and things like that. Uh, and they just ask people politely to do these things. And I don't, I don't see that as enough. I don't think the politicians or whoever is trying to give us leadership in this is really, th they're not really sh acting as it, if it's really a serious issue. And then the contradiction is take the two minute shower and then then, uh, then you hear about, and most people don't even know about fracking, and the use of large amounts of water and putting chemicals in it, and also large tunnels that are taking uh, sludge or water from one place to the other and that's going to leak or whatever. So you hear these huge contradictions and a lack of really telling even the citizenry what's happening. You know. Uh, I told someone about fracking that they had never even heard of it. They don't know what it is. And I don't know if it has to be by countries that you get together and start making real changes because I don't see either on a local, a state, or a federal level that we are seriously 
working together, like you would need to do like in World War II when we went to war and they made changes in all level. So everybody knew that they were participating in a, in a program that was important. But it, that needs to be done and it's not being done. There's a book called The Great Disruption by Paul Gilding, uh, who's a professor at Oxford, who writes about a Pearl Harbor moment uh, in climate. And uh, some, what, what a Pearl Harbor moment, some people thought a Pearl Harbor moment might have been Sandy, but it didn't really work out that way. Did Sandy really change that much? But his thesis is that there will be a Pearl Harbor moment when the government will, like they did in World War II, say, Detroit, you're not, you're not making cars anymore, you're going to make planes that there's going to be a real strong government intervention into the economy, into people's lives. Uh, so that's, that's the great disruption. He lays out that case. Uh, we can debate what might trigger that. Uh, individual action, uh, we know, you know better than I do, that most of the water use in the state is, is from, from ag. Uh, it's not residential or urban use. So, uh, but I would still say it's important to take those two two-minute showers to, to use less uh, rather than to use more. Uh, politicians are not going to lead us. They're followers. They're not leaders. And we refer to them as leaders. That's why I think getting the culture and changing our social norms and behavior, that makes it safer. Uh, politicians who try to lead get voted out of office sometimes uh, if they ask sacrifice or things that the voters don't like. Uh, so th there has been some policy leadership, certainly in California and other places. I wouldn't look for it nationally. I don't know. You want to add anything to that, Colin? Yeah, as I mentioned this morning, uh, my opening comments, uh, you know, climate change is not, not a priority with the U.S. Congress uh, because it's not a priority for most Americans. So they are followers. Any more questions? There's one here, two here. You, you mentioned climate. Uh, change and carbon tax a couple of times, carbon tax. And I'm just wondering if you, where you see that in, in light of the need to have uh, action at the individual level and whether action to build political will for a carbon tax is, is a viable thing for individuals to do as, as part of that um, things that individuals can do. And you sound like you're familiar with a group called Citizens Climate Lobby because you're talking very much in tune with what we are doing at Citizens Climate Lobby. I am familiar with Citizens Climate Lobby and familiar of the, you know, the, the rationality of, of, a, of a price on carbon, a carbon tax. Uh, it's thought to be a no, non-starter. Uh, a carbon tax politically. I sat down with F Senator Feinstein once. I asked her about a proposal that came out of California to raise, add a penny a gallon per month to the price of gasoline for 10 years. So 12 cents a year for 10 years. G gas goes up by $1.20. We hardly would notice that. It fluctuates by that much already due to seasonal and other, mar you know, uh, Libya, et cetera, right? Uh, this was a proposal that came out of the auto industry, had some people on that. I think George Schultz was part of it. And Senator Feinstein said no. So politician, I mean, saying no to a price increase, a, a tax of some sort. We've had a carbon tax, essentially, on, on gasoline. The price has gone up a lot. It hasn't affected uh, demand all that much. Do I think carbon policies, carbon price, carbon tax, or carbon fee is smart policy? Yes, particularly if it's revenue neutral and the money goes back to people. You know, we're starting to see here in California, you your, your utility bill, you start to see the carbon rebate uh, now. It's like, uh, is it good policy? Yes, it would take a real pivot by the Republican Party. Do I think a President Romney could have introduced a carbon tax? Maybe. You know, could a Republican president, more likely in the Nixon to China kind of way, more likely that a Republican president could get a carbon tax through uh, if the Tea Party was less, less of an issue in, in, in future Congresses. Uh, do I think a Democrat could? No way. Um, is it st still important? Some kind of price on carbon? Eventually there'll be a price on carbon. The oil companies are planning on it. They already have it priced into their models. So carbon is being priced in different ways around the world, in California, Australia, other places. We will see a price on carbon. 
We need to. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, you had said that fear makes companies move faster. And so while you have the fear and the more like the storytelling out in the public eye, and if I think that is it, if fear makes companies move faster, does fear also make consumers move faster that also pushes those companies to make different decisions that could like today we've been talking a lot about just um, the effects of climate change at the farm level, but I was also thinking like for food processors, so if, like growers who supply food processors that supply like the Safeways or the Walmarts or the Costcos, if they're getting that consumer push because of the fear, do, do you think that we have to be worried that fear is going to move policies faster than uh, food processors and growers can keep up with, that then you're gonna see a shift from it leaving California and now you'll see food processing in countries that have less efficient food manufacturing practices? So let me explain. So food, uh, fear in companies, I think if, uh, if, if there isn't a little bit of fear, then companies will do what's comfortable within this quarter. They'll have some incremental pr approaches. We'll do like, okay, we can kind of, you know, put a little green wrapper around things and call that progress. Uh, and, and they won't do enough uh, to really stretch their, uh, their, to innovate, to change their way, their way of operations. Uh, so I think there needs to be a little bit of concern, urgency. Otherwise, business will do what's comfortable, not, well, not what's necessary. Uh, now, in terms of you know, food, et cetera, I'm not an expert in that area. You, Colin's probably a better person to, to speak to whether uh, you know, s changes might outstrip the, the ability for California sub producers and, then, and things might be offshored or m move to other jurisdictions. Um, I know that, that uh, incumbents often move slower, and it's the upstarts or small innovators that are often more nimble and move quickly. But that, yeah, I'm sitting next to an expert, so I'm going to ask him to, to answer that instead of me. I'll come back to that after we uh, take the next question. Hi. I want to thank you. We, we listened to a bunch of econo economists talk about rationality and rational solutions to this problem and all the great policy changes and the things we're really proud of in the United States were not based on rationality, they're based on emotionality. The civil rights movement, the, the civil war, the, the uh, dealing with all those problems, those are all emotional solutions. People. So can you talk a little about, about the frames and the metaphors? George Lakoff, you interviewed him. He talks about frames and metaphors that help us conceptualize and emotionally grasp the problem. Can you share some of these things that get us out of this, this e economist talk, which, I mean, I have an MBA and I understand how to do this stuff, but it just fails us in terms of really moving us forward and making some changes that we really need to do. Well, I think, uh, thank you. Uh, so he, he, you know, Lakoff, he wrote The Political Mind. He talked a little bit about the, the, the brain circuitry. Uh, and there's another author I mentioned, uh, John Carter, John Carter, Cotter, who's at uh, Harvard Business School. He wrote a book called The Heart of Change. And he looked at organizational change and change management. A lot of change management in large organizations actually fails. One of his points is that the, the change that, it, that is successful and endures has a heart con component to it. This is Harvard Business School. This is not, uh, you know, some uh, other sort of... Uh, retreat in Marin saying this. So uh, th 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 for change to be enduring and have connection with people, it has to connect to something bigger than themselves. Uh, you mentioned civil rights movement, et cetera. Uh, a lot of those big social change movements also had charismatic leaders who forgave. Nelson Mandela came out of jail and, and forgave, invited some his jailers to his inauguration. Uh, you know, King, uh, Gandhi, these sorts of examples, they didn't villainize, demonize, you know, Gandhi said he pitied the British because they grew up under this, under that, that terrible system. Uh, Lakoff, you be best to read his books rather than, you know, um, or listen to the podcast that's in iTunes, it's called e Ecological Intelligence, uh, but he does, he actually says that emotions enable reason and understanding, that they're not a contradiction, you know, that they actually complement each other. Uh, you saw Senator Feinstein recently, um, was sort of was dismissed like she was having an emotional reaction, which is a very sort of sexist gender thing, uh, to the to the revelation that the NSA was spying on members of Congress. Like oh, like like that's if you're emotional, you're not reasonable, et cetera. Well, you know, we're we're a combination of both, right? And so I think it takes hearts and minds to 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 address this. It takes economics, it takes rationality, but that's just part of the piece. That's part of the puzzle. Um, 
Right. And if you're not rational, you're, yeah. So if you're emotional, somehow you're being, you know, but the behavioral economists, they're the ones who are on the rise right now, right? And they're understanding that rational economic man, like I learned in the 80s, doesn't really exist. We make all sorts of decisions that are not, that are blended emotions and, and rationality. Okay. I think with that, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, our time is short. It's been a long day. Thanks to everyone for coming, and thank you very much. Greg. Thank you, Colin, for putting this on, for including me. I appreciate it. Yeah.